So let's pray, and then we're going to dig into, uh, it's funny because uh, I have about 20 minutes of teaching, and <laughs> it's funny because it's, it's all about food. <laughs> I, did, I love how God works. It was just so, I'm like, oh, this is so great. It's all about food. Because remember, we ended with the Samaritan woman uh, last week, right? And she was so excited. Remember, she left her water pot, and she went running, right, to tell everybody that, ah, oh, I met Jesus. You have to come meet him now, too. He knows. He knows all about me. He loves me and this, listen, all my sin and this, right? And then they all, right, okay. So, so and I feel so much like her. So anyway, what, what it is is, remember, the disciples had left to go to Sychar to get some what? Food. And they had returned, right? And they were trying to have Jesus eat some food. And Jesus, once again, just, as only Jesus would do, said, um, you know what? Let's talk about real food here, right? And so I love how we're going to be uh, munching on wonderful potluck food, but now we're going to learn about the real food that only Jesus can give. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you're the one who can only give us real food and that you're living water and that there's no one else but that. And so we praise your name, Jesus. We love you. We praise you. We, we thank you that we can celebrate your, your crib, your cradle, but we can celebrate your cross at the same time because without the cross, it would have been unnecessary for you to come. So thank you for stepping out of eternity into time and then into our hearts because you took all of our sin, past, present, and future, on the cross for us, for me. And I so love you, Lord. So I ask, Lord God, that you would absolutely speak because we are listening. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody said? Amen. Amen, amen, amen. All right, open up to John 4. <clears throat> we are at the last of John 4. And um, I'll start in verse 27. And this is when the disciples are coming back with full tummies. Uh, just then his disciples arrived, and they were amazed that he was talking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? Then the woman left her water jar, went into town, and told the men, come see a man who told me everything I did. Could this be the Messiah? They left the town and made their way to him. In the meantime, the disciples kept urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said, I have food to eat that you don't know about. The disciples said to one another, could someone have brought him something to eat? Don't you love this? You guys, the disciples are still, ah, oh, Santa. You know, like, duh. I mean, did somebody already feed the guy? I mean, you, that would have been me, right? That would have been you, right? I love that. The disciples said to one another, could someone have brought him something to eat? Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you say there are still four more months, then comes the harvest? Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields, for they are ready for harvest. The reaper is already receiving pay and gathering fruit for eternal life, so the sower and reaper can rejoice together. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I set you to reap what you didn't labor for. Others have labored, and you have benefited from their labor. Now, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what the woman said when she testified. He told me everything I ever did. Therefore, when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of what he said, and they told the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this really is the Savior of the world. See, that's what happens, isn't it? That's what happens. You get to share your testimony. You get to share your story. You just share your story. You just share your story. And you ask him to meet Jesus. And now it's like, I got my own story. Right? I have my own story now. I have my own story. So <clears throat> Jesus is now teaching uh, his disciples the source of his strength and the source of his satisfaction. So he is... I, I, I love how he just brings in the, the common elements of the water, and then he talked about, I'm living water. And now, he, you know, the guys are saying, well, somebody must have fed him, and now he's bringing in, no, see, I, I'm doing the will of my father. That, that's my food. That's my food. 
And so he says, I, he tells the disciples, look, I, I have food to eat, which you do not even know, which you don't, know, which you don't even know. So the disciples had gone into a town in Samaritan to get food and wanted Jesus to eat what they brought him back, right? So here's what Charles Spurgeon said about this. It is right for the spiritual man to forget his hunger, but it is equally right for his true friends to remind him that he ought to eat for his health's sake. It is commendable for the worker to forget his weakness and press forward in holy service. But it is proper for the humane and thoughtful to interpose with the word of caution and to remind the ardent spirit that his frame is but dust. I think the disciples did well to say, Master, eat. Now, Jesus wasn't saying that food and drink, you know, that they weren't important, okay, and that, you know, rest isn't important. He wasn't saying that. He wanted to tell his disciples that there's so much more. There's just so much more. Life was way more than these things because man does not eat by bread alone, by bread alone, okay? And so when he says, I, think of the pronouns here, I have food to eat of which you do not know, okay? The pronouns are important here. They're emphatic. In other words, he's saying, I am refreshed by nourishment hidden from you, okay? I am refreshed from nourishment hidden from you, okay? So in these words, what Jesus is speaking, it's revealing his strength, and it's also revealing the weakness of his disciples. It's revealing his strength and where his strength comes from, but it's also revealing the weakness of his disciples because he goes on to say it, what? My food is to do the will of him, meaning his father, who sent me. That is my food. That is my food. Jesus had a greater source of strength and satisfaction than the food he ate, okay? Um, if you remember uh, good old Job and everything Job went through, right? One of the main verses of Job that I have memorized and loved and have, has become very personal to me is Job 23.12, when he has said, I have not departed from the commandment of your lips, O God. I have treasured your words more than my very sustenance. Sustenance is food that you have to have to keep living. It's not like our potluck fun food that we are having, right, because it tastes so yummy. Sustenance is food that you have to have to keep your body living. And Job is saying, oh, no, 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 see, see, I have treasured your words more than my very sustenance. In other words, you are my food. Your words are my food. And this is what Jesus is telling the disciples. I, I have a greater source of strength. I have a greater source of satisfaction than the food I'm eating. And, and he's explaining to his disciples as they've just gone and filled their tummy. You have to remember this, right? And he's filled the Samaritan woman with himself. And his true satisfaction was to do just that, to do the will of the Father that sent him. And so Jesus, Jesus didn't have his focus primarily on, I want you to understand this, on the work or the need or the strategy or the techniques or even on the needy soul like the Samaritan woman, remember? His focus was on doing the will of the Father that sent him. Whatever that is, whatever that is, I'm gonna do the will of the Father. So he kept his focus on him and then he needed to be in Samaria. And then the Samaritan woman sitting there and then he shares with her and then she comes to know. And then see, his focus is on the will of his Father. It's not about, you know, the techniques or strategy or I got to win souls because it's, you know, I'm Jesus. Are you kidding me? That's not who he is. His focus was doing the will of the Father who sent him. In other words, he, he, he knew that his main focus was to come and to die for the sins of the world, past, present, and future, to be that perfect sacrifice once and for all, and he was going to keep the main thing the main thing. And along the way, he discipled, and he taught, and he showed them, I'm God. I'm God. Jesus equals God. 
and the experience of countless others through the century has proved Jesus' truth in that statement. We're to be about doing the will of the Father that sent us. We're here, remember Stuart says, we don't die, we're not born one day too early, we're, we don't die one day too late, right? That's, you know, you're not, you die on time, or you're born on time, you die on time, you're born on time, you die on time, right? We're here to do the will of the Father. And, and there's nothing more satisfying than joining God in what he's doing. You're not happy enough about this, okay? <laughs> this is a good, good thing that we get to join him in what he is doing, and whatever that looks like for each of us as particular believers, okay? I know that this is like counterintuitive and, and, and against our natural self-seeking, but it's true. It's not about you got to do this, 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 this. See, when you keep a readied heart and you just want to please the Father in everything you do and say, guess what? He gives you opportunities. He opens up doors. He does this. He does this. He puts somebody in your path, like at the hospital where Jeanette was. Right? This is what he does. This is what he does. This is just doing the will of the Father that sent me. That's why we're here. Otherwise, we'd be there. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. Here's what Spurgeon says. The man of the world thinks that if he could have his own way, he would be perfectly happy. And his dream of happiness in this state or in the next is comprised in this, that his own wishes will be gratified, his own longings fulfilled, his own desires granted to him. This is all a mistake. A man will never be happy in this way. I tried to be happy that way, did you? Oh yeah, I tried. I tried for 31 years. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I tried really hard. Did you guys try really hard? I tried really hard, okay? And, and meanwhile, he's like, no, no, Margo, it's me. It's me. And he just keeps going after you, going after you, going after you. And Jesus found great, great satisfaction in doing the will of the Father. And you know what? Even when he was weary, he was weary when he sat down at the well in Samaria, right? He was weary, but he found great satisfaction in doing the will of of the Father, right? That the conscious doing of God's will refreshed the weary Jesus. Did you know that it will refresh you too? The conscious doing of God's will will refresh you. Time and time and time and time again. It will refresh you. Because he's this living water. He's the refreshing in you. He's the refreshing in you. And so think about his you know, Jesus' bodily thirst because he'd been walking all that time and it was dusty and it was uh, into Samaria and, and uh, from the time of day. And, and I'm sure he had felt that way before, that he was weary and he was thirsty. And he had and had forgotten in the carrying on of the divine work. When he sat down with the Samaritan woman, all of a sudden the living water took over from his weariness. Are you following me? Okay, all of a sudden he wasn't weary anymore. The living water was taking over. Living water was taking over because now he's pouring into and refreshing. You know, we, when you refresh someone else, it says you, you in turn get refreshed. He's now refreshing this woman. See, that's what happens. That's what happens time and time and time again. And so he says, look it, I'm here to finish the work that he sent me. I like that he says finish. Finish the work, okay? He didn't just find mere satisfaction in starting God's work here on earth, but he finished it. But he finished it, okay? And so when you think about this, this, this completes the thought begun in this previous verse that we just read. Jesus was totally surrendered to the master's will. Totally surrendered to God's will. He was on a completely recognized commission from the Father. He knew what his job was. Remember Christmas? What did he say? Night, it was the night before? This body, you're not satisfied with sacrifice of bulls and goats, but this body you've made for me, so I will go. I will go. I'll do the will of the Father that sent me, right? So Jesus came to do, and he came to finish his work. In fact, that very same word, finish, is what he said on the cross, is what he said on the cross, right? When Jesus cried, it is finished. John 19, verse 30. Same exact word. He came to finish his work 
And on the cross, he said, it is finished. Complete circle. So in, in 35 through 38, Jesus is teaching his disciples then uh, about this urgency of spiritual work and opportunity, even though they have, you know, they're full with their food, and he's telling them, look, you need this real food. He's now teaching them about the ur urgency of spiritual work and opportunity. And he says, look it, do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes. Look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. Okay, and so he says, look at I know you're thinking that there's not any particular hurry for this because there's an old proverb with the idea uh, that there's a, not a particular hurry for a task because you can simply take time and obviously you can't avoid the waiting. And Jesus did not want his disciples to have this proverb mentality at all. He wanted them to think and act as the harvest was ready now. The harvest is ready now. The harvest is ready now. The harvest is ready now. So he wanted them to lift your eyes up, lift your eyes up, look at the fields, for they're already white with harvest. You guys are, you know, are waiting around. You're thinking this. No, you're a part of this harvest. So he's using the idea of food once again and harvest to communicate spiritual ideas. And so the harvest means that there are many, many people that are just ready, willing, able, and waiting to be rescued and to be received into the kingdom of God. What are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? The harvest is ready. It's there. Invite your friends. Have them come to Bible study. Tell them the good news. He does all the rest. He does all the rest. The harvest is ready and that we should know that there's someone that he is preparing right in front of us because it's ready because it's ready and see we we, we need to see ourselves like the disciples he was telling them you need to be workers you need to be reapers you need to be reapers in that harvest and just think about this as Jesus was speaking, as he's speaking to the disciples, saying, look up, it's, the harvest is ready right now, the Samaritans are running, running to Jesus to meet him. Because one woman went and told her story. One woman who was an outcast, who they wouldn't even talk to before, told him, I met Jesus and I'm changed. Come on, follow me. And so the Samaritans were running, leaving town and coming across the fields toward him. The eagerness of the people that the Jews regarded as aliens and rejected showed that they were like grain ready for the harvesting. Remember, we started this story with the Jews absolutely going around Samaria a very, very long way because they hated the Samaritans. But Jesus needed to go through Samaria. Because why? Because of the one woman, one woman's testimony, and then the Samaritans coming to know him. Right? The harvest is now. It's white. It's white. He warned his disciples to not think there's still four months and then comes the harvest, right? If you have eyes to see it, the harvest is ready now. He wants you to see it's ready now. It's white for harvest, implying that the grain was fully ripe or it was actually overripe. Let's get going. You have to remember, just like uh, Charity saying, right? Waymaker, he's always working. Even when you don't see it, he's working. Even when you don't feel it, he's working. God's always working. He's calling you to fulfill the will of the Father with him. Come on. Come on. You're part of the motley crew. You're my disciples. Let's go. Let's go. Let's share the good news, right? And so 
We should believe that they are already white for harvest. We need to believe that, right? And then what happens when you believe that? You expect a present blessing, and you see him work, and you get to follow him in what he's doing. Because he says, he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. So Jesus was encouraging his disciples in three ways. Your work in the harvest will be rewarded. That's a very cool thing. He's rewarding you, right? He says what? He who reaps receives wages, so you're going to be rewarded. And he says, look, the good of your work is going to last how long? Forever, forever and ever. I mean, that's good working, right? Right? I mean, I, you know, just doing about four or five loads of laundry, I don't know, it happens again, it happens again, right? It doesn't last forever, right? There's a reward in the beginning, but then you do it, not this, this lasts forever. This lasts forever and ever and ever. It says, gathers fruit for eternal life. This is good work to be involved in. This is this is eternal work to be involved in. And then he says, every worker in the harvest would rejoice together in the work. So either you're sowing or you're reaping, but you still rejoice together. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So the disciples could reap a harvest immediately as they reaped it from seeds they had not sown. Who had sown those seeds recently? John the Baptist and Jesus. But they were reaping the harvest from those seeds that were sown, right? And at the moment, the disciples had, what, the opportunity to reap that harvest. You see how that works? It doesn't matter who, who, um, who sows it or who waters it. Remember in, uh, what was it in? Uh, First Corinthians. Remember how it was, it doesn't matter if you're Paul or Apollos or this, one waters, one plants, the seed, one this, one that, there's harvest. In other words, you all work together because he's the one doing the harvesting as we continue to plant and water and plant the seeds. And then we, at times, get to see him do this amazing harvest, right? As we work and work and work and work with him. And so he's like, okay, look, here's what happens. Now, these Samaritans believe on the Savior of the world. They were like shutaways. They were like outcasts. They were like, and Jesus had to go through Samaria. And now these Samaritans believe in the Savior of the world, okay? So when they're running to him, and they believed him at that moment, they didn't know enough to trust. Listen carefully. They didn't know enough to trust Jesus and his work on the cross. But they certainly could believe him, believe in him as the Messiah, as the promised one, as the savior of the world, right? And they did believe. And you know why they did? It's just because of the word of the woman who testified. Don't you want that to be you? I want that to be me, right? Don't you want that to be you? Because of the word of the woman who testified. Because of the word of Karen who testified. Because of the word of Myra who testified. Right? That's what you want. That they believe. That they would believe. And, and how she went, and once again it says that she, he I mean, he told me, like, everything I've ever done. Like, and it was all, like, bad stuff, right? And she's like, and, and he still loved me. And he still loved me, right? Knowing the whole facts of my life, right? See, we sometimes fear that if someone knew all that I ever did, that they couldn't love us, don't we? Don't we? Yeah. Yeah. But Jesus loved this woman. just like Jesus loved me. You all my yuck. He said, already died for that. Already forgiven. Let's make it new. And so Jesus stayed there for two days. Isn't that sweet? Not only is he a Jew and he's Jesus, right, and everything, but he stays there now for two days. 
He needed to be in Samaria. He stayed there for two days. Remarkable. That's remarkable in the light of the Jewish people of Jesus' day regarding Samaritans. What? Jesus is staying there two days? I mean, remember, they avoided that as much as possible, but not Jesus. He needed to be there. He needed to be there, and he stayed there two days. Why? Because there was a harvest. Because there was a harvest. There were a number, number of believers, and they were supplementing the woman's work time and time and time again. And many, many believed because of his own word. Now, now, they were coming because of the testimony of this woman, and now they're believing because of his own word because now they've met Jesus, okay? And so in the days that Jesus spent with him, he taught them. He taught them, right? And many more believed. That's how it happens. That's how it happens. One by one by one by one by one by one by one. By one. And that, right? That's how it happens. And so what they believed is, indeed, this is the Christ, the Savior of the world. So the remarkable testimony of this woman connected these Samaritans of Sychar to Jesus. But in hearing him, they came to what? They came to a deeper personal faith in knowing the Messiah, the Savior, the promised one, personally. Personally. <clears throat> Savior of the world. And that's such a big, big deal because the Samaritans are now realizing personally that he's the Savior of the world, not of just the Jews only, Jesus came for me, not just the Jews only, but the Samaritans and the whole Gentile world as well. He's the Savior of the world. And so the title, the Savior of the world, was prompted by the teaching of Jesus himself during his two days in residence there. See, that's, that's what happens when living water and Food that is your source and your satisfaction, that isn't physical food, takes over you and you're doing the will of the Father that sent you. You can't help but share the good news. You can't help it. It's not like you have to think, oh yeah, four months there's going to be a harvest. No, 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 no. You can hardly wait to share. Because there's harvest all around you. And it's not about you doing it, it's not about this, it's about him drawing people to himself and us sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Perfect time for Christmas this time, right? To be able to share that, perfect time, perfect time. A lot of people are going through some pretty lonely times right now, pretty lonely times. And however you came today, I want you to know how loved you are. I don't know where you are with him. I'm sure most of you know Jesus personally. But he wants you to move to passionately. He wants you to move to powerfully. He wants you to move to preeminently. Like He wants to be like over everything where he is your total focus and the harvest is now. The harvest is now and you're just part of joining him and doing the will of the Father that sent you, just like Jesus. And all that living water just keeps bubbling up, bubbling up and bubbling up and over onto others as well as the source of satisfaction of food because he's the living word. Living bread. So just check this Christmas time. Just check where you are with him. It's a good thing to do a checkup with Jesus, you know. He's, you know, super honest, you know that. Except he loves you to pieces and he'll just keep drawing you to himself more and more and more and more. I read something that I put on Facebook the other day that uh, really hit home by Francis Chan. And it was about um, this amazing how Jesus is. We, we just know how like amazing he is and how he, he gives and how he loves and how 
you know, he's the one who has created the stars and the galaxies and E minor and, and pine needles and all. I mean, and it just went into this beautiful um, story, just a short little story of who he is and, and how he made us. And then at the end, it said, and then what we do is we sing songs and nod our heads and try not to cuss. See, if we really were here doing the will of the Father that sent us, this world would be turned upside down for Jesus Christ. It would be. It would be. We wouldn't be just singing songs, showing up at church, 45 minutes a, a week, and trying not to come. So my prayer is that we are so filled up to overflowing with his living water and his living food, his bread in us, that this Christmas we're overflowing with him. Not us, not our flesh, not everything we have to get ready making sure that we have a readied heart, that we're doing the will of the Father that sent us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the Savior of the world and that we know that you are indeed the Christ. And I thank you that you have asked us to join you in what you're doing. God, sometimes we just become settled in maybe traditions or in something other than knowing you more. God, forgive us. Forgive us. Help us to fall on our faces, knowing you more and loving you more in these next two weeks, Jesus. And also, uh, thank you so much for the actual yummy physical food that you have made for us today to enjoy with fellowship. Always, um, all through the word of God, you always had food and food and food, and it was such a fellowship time, Lord, and I, I thank you for that. I ask that we would get to know each other more and share more into one another's lives deeper. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.